My name is Pascal Pichona, and as president of the European Law Institute, it is my privilege and my great pleasure to welcome you all to this ELI webinar on the ELI report on business and human rights, access to justice and effective remedies. Fundamental issues of the rule of law are at play in this report, as we will hear tonight. And indeed, the rule of law in the 21st century is one of the three pillars of ELI's project portfolio next to uh, the law and governance for the digital age and sustainable life and society. Established in collaboration with FRA, the EU Agency on Fund for Fundamental Rights, this ELI report acknowledges that corporations, which can exercise economic and social influence that sometimes re re rivals that of nation states may engage in practices that negatively impact human rights. Access to justice by victims of such violations can often be hindered in practice by a number of factors. This triggers the need for judicial collective redress procedures and for effective non-judicial mechanisms. It is also of utmost importance to have access to information. This is why, as we will hear tonight, the report explains also how the link between human rights, due diligence and remedies could work properly. Tonight, we have just a fabulous panel of speakers. They will all discuss this report from a different angle and we'll have 10 minutes each to do so. And then you will have uh, uh, the uh, possibility to have uh, questions asked to the panelists. Let me already thank the panelists for giving us the honor and the pleasure of being with us tonight. Uh, I'm, I'm truly thrilled by what we will hear and the paths that their reflections and of course the report uh, have opened uh, will also be of utmost interest. I truly look forward listening to all these speakers, but before I do so, let me give you some technical instructions. You have a Q&R button and through this, you will be able to ask questions. So do not wait the end to ask questions because of course, the sooner the better also in order to uh, have a chance to have your question picked during the uh, uh, Q&A session at the end after all panelists have presented uh, their um, um, speech. Now, let me uh, introduce first our, our first speaker, it is Diana Wallis, which is one of the project co-reporter. Diana Wallis is a dispute resolution professional, chair elect of the Law Society's EU committee and president of the board of EUDIS InfoLab. And she's also doing consultancy work on dispute resolution system for among others, uh, uh, change.org. Now, Diana Wallis was a member of the European Parliament from 1999 until 2012, and was elected as vice president of the uh, European Parliament in 2007, and for a second time in 2009. She was also president of the European Law Institute and served two terms uh, from September 2013 to September 2017. So we have here an exceptional speaker who not only knows ELI very well, but also the needs of the European Parliament. Therefore, I really look forward, Diana, to listen to you. You have the floor. Yeah, Pascal, thank you very much. Uh for that introduction. Um, and it's very good to be uh, involved in presenting this last big report that I was involved in uh, for ELI at, the, at this webinar tonight. And I suppose I wanted to start in that sense by giving perhaps a little bit of background this was always something that I had felt strongly about, and I think most of us probably that are gathered tonight do, that if Europe in its widest sense is um, serious about its values of protecting human rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights, then it needs to give pathways to victims of breaches of those human rights to be able to exercise their access to justice and more importantly 
to get to an actual remedy. And I think what we saw was that this pathway to justice and to remedy um, is strewn with all sorts of obstacles and difficulties. And so it was that back in 2017, just at the end of my term as president of ELI, I was approached um, by um, Jonas Grimm, head of um, FRAV, the Fundamental Rights Agency, um, to talk about the possibility of this joint report. And I think we both felt that both organisations, as you've rightly said, had much to bring to this um, joint endeavour, especially as FRA at that stage had just published a report on this topic, noting, if I put it just basically, that all the member states had signed up to these ideas about um, giving access to justice where there is breach of human rights by corporate entities. Um, but as I've already said, the path to that justice and remedy seemed uh, somewhat difficult to exercise. So as we began to put this joint project together, we looked at the continuing research that FRA was doing, which you're gonna hear more later. But we also, in terms of the expertise that we had around the table, began to look at what issues we could home in on. And first of all, obviously, there is due diligence. And it's quite clear that this was being tackled already by certain member states around the European Union in differing ways. And that, of course, is always, as it were, a warning light that perhaps action needs to be taken uh, by the EU rather than getting um, a rather higgledy-piggledy picture um, across the piece that makes uh, understandable, it, it being very difficult to understand and therefore again uh, to access. So due diligence was the first issue that our report uh, tackled. Um, then of course, often we're talking about standard legal processes and access to justice through the courts. And class actions, group actions, collective redress, whatever you want to call it, has always been a difficult topic um, at the EU level. But having said that, the EU has arrived at a situation where consumers have been given the right to class actions. So if you're going to give that right there to consumers who are exercising economic interests, how much more so should you not be considering it in terms of situations where there has been actual human rights breach? So what we did was take that consumer collective redress as a basis, but also, and this is the beauty of ELI, we were able to build on the work that had been done on collective redress in two former projects of ELI, but most particularly the one on civil procedure, so that we were able to put on the table in this report a worked through system of collective redress that is European in its conception, based on existing legislation, uh, and as I say, has the benefit of the wisdom of a huge number of people from ELI who worked on the civil procedure uh, project. We then also, and you will hear more about this uh, later from Ilaria, looked at rules of private international law, um, which of course can make access to justice extremely difficult. Um, and we have some very, I think, uh, innovative proposals uh, to make that make there. Then many people had suggested to us that we should be looking at alternative pathways to remedy. So things like um, ADR methods like maybe mediation, maybe arbitration. We did look at those, but we also were kept firmly on track by some members of our team 
who felt that absolutely you have to be able to get to a remedy. And more often or not, that requires some sort of coercive power that either is to be exercised by the courts or some other entity that can actually bring you in bring you enforcement. Um, so one of the ideas that we came up with that has been used and discussed at national level is the idea of a sort of super European ombudsman, uh, perhaps for a wide area of corporate responsibility, but certainly for this specific area. And some people will say, well, aren't you complicating issues, introducing some sort of new European entity? But sometimes the space that you enter as a legislator is already so complicated and you're patching old bits of legislation that sometimes perhaps it's almost as good to think of something completely new that can cut through all of this. So, so it was that we decided to put on the table this suggestion of an EU level ombudsman who could deal with these cases and would have substantial powers to investigate, which is often very important and cannot easily be done by the courts, able to investigate and able to fine. And we look, if we look at the powers that EU, the EU has, both in the internal market area and the competition area, I have little doubt with a little um, thinking we could get to something very effective. So that's one of the other ideas we put forward. We also, of course, wanted uh, more action at a member state level, more transparency uh, in terms of monitoring um, and, and, and what is done there. So those were the different areas that the report goes through. And I just wanted to conclude my remarks with some thoughts about, in a sense it's about transparency, but it's, it's also about what we as consumers face and what we see going on and, and how do we do something. If you want to look at how difficult litigation has become, we can look at the case that's ongoing or has been ongoing in Ecuador with Chevron. And we see a lawyer ending up in prison, wrongly or rightly, it's hard for us to judge, having finally managed to get um, a result for the indigenous people uh, in Ecuador. So this is a sort of, litigation that can go on and on and round and round and it becomes a real carousel and the people that are victims are the ones that don't get the attention they deserve. We need journalists and others to report things for us. We recently had um, a very good um, piece of investigative journalism which came onto the British TV about the British company Dyson uh, and what it has been possibly up to or facilitating in Malaysia. Now it took journalists investigating to bring that to the fore and then now they have got a law firm in London that is trying to take it forward but I've no doubt that will be a long and tortuous route and what we were trying to do is you know how can we make this simpler of course it has to be fair to both sides, but at the moment there is a tremendous inequality of arms. And just one last thought as to what we can all do. One of my Christmas books was a book about George Orwell called Orwell's Roses. And of course Orwell was always campaigning on various political issues, but the lady who wrote this relates in a way sort of building on the way Orwell would have looked at things about the way in which roses, flowers are produced in Bogota for the US market. And it's truly frightful. And it may be a small thing, but now every time I buy some flowers or maybe I make more effort 
it's time to cut the daffodils from my own garden. I look where they've come from and I look how they've been produced. And I guess that's something we must all do going forward to check what we buy. Um, and that's one way of doing this. But there are other ways through all the sorts of ideas in this report um, that have, have come to the fore. And I hope that we have set out and that they will now be discussed more widely and that it will help the European legislature uh, as it goes forward with some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Diana. Thank you also for showing how broad this report is in covering so many different subjects, but yet bringing new ideas and also being really going into uh, some very important details that we will uh, look into uh, right now uh, with the uh, various speakers. And the next panelist is uh, Ilaria Pretelli. Uh, she's a legal counsel and expert in private international law at the Swiss Institute of Comparative Law in, in Lausanne. And she's also an editor of the Yearbook of Private International Law, member of many associations and committees uh, or editorial uh, committees for, for um, uh, uh, reviews. And uh, she's a, full, uh, a member of the European Commission's expert group on parenthood. She was a formerly uh, practicing lawyer and lecturer in international law in Italy. She has been visiting professor at the Jean Monnet faculty in Paris and the director of the Center, Centre d'études juridiques européennes. So she speaks all the languages, truly European. And the international and comparative dimension of family law, global governance and digital platform are some of her main topic of interest. And of course, also protection of children and other vulnerable subject by means of private international law and fundamental rights. She was a project, or she is a project team member, and, and it's in that capacity that she will now uh, address us. Ilaria, you have the floor. Thank you for your kind presentation and thanks to Diana for having introduced so um, well the, the, the topic also for private international law. Um, here, of course, the substantial problem that we experience is this uh, recurrently observable criminal behavior, sometimes criminal behavior by, by a limited number, I have to say, a limited number of multinational corporation yet um, able that have been have shown us that are able to, to carry out careless corporate activities in, in uh, often in lower income states. We, we mentioned Ecuador, Bogota, um, and uh, this happens regardless of their impact on, uh, on human rights and uh, often on um, uh, the environment. In so doing, this uh, limited number of corporation um, make themselves liable even of gross violations of, of, of human rights. Uh, and interestingly enough, a conspicuous number of these behaviors is already prohibited by public international law and by most national legal orders. This is the reason why we speak about access to remedy rather than going to the creation of new forms of liability. We don't, we don't need this. The rule prohibiting child labor, for, for instance, is well established and recognized, for instance, by the uh, UN Convention on the Right of the Child of 1989, um, which has been ratified by uh, almost all the states of the world, except uh, with the notable exception of the, of the US. However, the International Labor Organization is telling us that a total of uh, 152 million children are victims of, of child labor uh, and circa 10% of the all the children that are uh, globally present in the world. So paradoxically, uh, criminal behaviors of corporation take place because it is still a, a possible to avoid and circumvent rules prohibiting hazardous activities. And this possibility exists because domestic laws and judicial system diverge. The legal divide in human rights and environmental standards between developing and developed countries uh, explains the reasons why corporation 
decide to outsource their lucrative activities in, in these countries. So when investi investing in these countries, um, these, these corporation may uh, keep the whole of their bargaining strength. Um, I, will, I, I, I make reference to a German report that I have been able to read recently, where um, in the fashion, the retailing sector, 70% uh, of the, of the um, value added in the supply chain takes place outside Germany, takes place in countries like Asia, in, in Turkey. And in order to, to end the, the possibility to exploit differences in legislation and curb uh, the possibility for, for corporations to increase um, their polluting activities, uh, the ELI project dedicates a whole chapter on how to tackle with the differences in, 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 in domestic laws and, and the judicial system. So how do we neutralize um, and how do we redirect the responsibility of, of hazardous activities from small local subsidiaries or commercial partners towards states from which the multinational corporation direct their business and build their fortune? Borrowing an expression which is well known, the, the, the objective of uh, the private international law chapter is really um, to serve as a, as a way to pierce corporate borders and, and try to uh, redirect the responsibility where it belongs. So there, there are two possible methods to practice, to neutralize this practice. Um, of outsourcing risks of liability for human rights violations. One approach, one approach which is well known, consists of ex extending the territorial scope of the laws and standards which create a duty of care. So uh, um, a duty of care has been created on companies which have a registered office, a central administration, or a principal base, um, uh, place of business in the European Union. This is one approach. The second approach instead consists in giving a wider recognition and space to the principle of favor lazy, to the principle of the protection of the weaker party, which is a principle that inspires certain solution uh, in private international law. Now, following the example of France, states like Switzerland and also the, the, the EU have created this specific duty of care for certain company. Uh, they are often selecting, selected according to their size and in relation to, to certain sectors, namely, for instance, the one of minerals. Now, this trend in legislation, which is certainly positive, has also created an increasingly dense um, regula regulatory framework. So uh, it has created a certain fragmentation which is not without creating additional risks. In particular, a fragmentary legislation may increase, if we look on the side of the corporations, their operational costs, and they will make it, it will make it difficult maybe for them to comply with multiple sectorial legislations. But on the other end, and, and, and it's the focus of the, of the project, um, it, can create additional hurdles for victims seeking to assess the liability of such corporations. So one of the problems, for instance, is the criteria used uh, to apprehend corporation on top of the value chain. Some EU directives, for instance, they include on, uh, on the scope companies operating in the internal market uh, or directing activities, having an authorization to distribute products, all these criteria, they, they have a common source, they derive from um, uh, targeting uh, jurisdiction rules, uh, um, but they should be reduced to a uniform criterion and should encourage the use of maybe a specific private international law rule. Against this uh, background, the, the recent directive proposal could have been here more courageous in superseding all these existing regulation, even though uh, it does re represent a, a, major, a major development, especially when it comes to enforcement mechanisms, civil liability and sanctions. 
So now the directive takes the, the, the approach of making the duty of care an overriding mandatory rule. This means when, that when the applicable law to a claim brought by victims of human rights and environmental harms is not the law of a member state, the rule, the national rules transposing the EU directive will need to prevail on that, on that law. Um, this, this solution, before the publication of the directive, the ELI project has also supported um, um, the creation of a, a statutory duty of care for EU companies so that victims of human rights and environmental violation committed by subsidiaries and business relations in third country could sue for breaches of that duty of care in courts having jurisdiction in the EU. But the, the ELI project, as, as, as anticipated by Diana, goes even further, uh, since it also takes the second, the second approach, which seems all the more necessary in, light, in the light of case law. If we take the example of uh, the litigation opposing Kiobel and the other widows of, of the Ugoni um, environmental activists executed in Nigeria, it's, it's last week, uh, on, the, on, on the March 23rd, uh, the Hague court rendered its just judgment rejecting the civil liability case against Shell of those widows, since evidence of the liability had not been, uh, had been insufficient to prove Shell's responsibility. But what is notable here is that the case, um, the, the execution had taken place in 1995, so the, the, the case, the class action, had been litigated before the US courts before arriving in Europe, in the Netherlands. And the, the legal dispute has brought the lawyers of both parties to explore for many months, for many years, issues of jurisdiction and applicable law. Our scientific blogs uh, have followed with interest all the battle on the ex extraterritorial application of the alien tort statutes, et cetera, et cetera. The, and the Dutch judges had been able to retain jurisdiction by means of, uh, thanks to the Brussels one regulation, even though it proved useless uh, last week, we have, to, we have to note that years are spent on um, jurisdiction issue, issues. And this is, against, this is a sort of denial of, 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 uh, of justice. It's against the interest of the parties seeking a, a remedy. So also um, the Netherlands were able to retain jurisdiction because of their domestic rules, not only because of the Brussels one regulation, other, other member states with different domestic rules may well have not have been, uh, what, um, may not have been able to retain uh, jurisdiction this created discordance uh, and, and the ELI project seeks to address this discordance also by suggesting the codification of adequate private international law rules. Um, jurisdiction is of course the main and first obstacle to overcome, but when seeking a forum in the EU, the non-EU victims of human rights violation are also looking for a better law, uh, are also looking for a, a law granting a, a better compensation for the loss suffered. And here the ELI project also uh, underlines the importance of ensuring that the same rule applies to uh, environmental damages and human rights violation, which is not the case at present, curiously, because in the present framework, sadly, um, this, the, the application of the same rule in private international law can only be ensured by way of interpretation. We only have a specific rule in Article 7 of the Rome 2 regulation uh, guaranteeing favor lazy, guaranteeing a protection, a favor, a more favorable treatment to the, to the victims of, of uh, human rights violation. But this is the fact that a favor lazy is only restricted to, to environmental damages and not other damages 
I guess it's due to accidental circumstances that have to do possibly because the choice was made under the influence of the famous case, uh, Min de Potas d'Alsace, a case concerning the pollution of the river Rhine. So in, in, in now we have this, this, uh, this uh, circumstance, we have this framework where environmental uh, victims of environmental damages can uh, choose where to sue, where to, on which law to base their claim if it is on the law of the, 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 the place where um, the conduct, the behavior was causing the damage uh, was decided, for instance, in cases of, um, uh, in, in our cases, in our litigation, we often see that the decision came was, was uh, taken in Europe, but the effect were in, 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 in a um, third state. So this Hilaria, is possible. Yes, you, you I, I, conclude, I conclude, uh, as regards the human rights violation, it, it, it would be possible to base the claim on the law of the place where the decision was taken only by characterizing this place as the most closely connected with the damage. And this is one of the proposal for changing private international law at least by way of the interpretation of our project. I am sorry <laughs> for the minutes taken um, uh, in addition, no. and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, and don't be sorry, because it's fascinating, of course, to find ways to cope with diversity in Europe, diversity of legal systems, and at the same time giving a kind of uniform access, which is a kind of uh, finding a way, uh, you know, uh, I mean, uh, um, finding uh, the way out of this circle and and so uh, i'm sure we will come back in the discussion on these type of cases and these difficulties to find the right approach uh, which i think is well presented in the report so now i have the pleasure to uh, give uh, the floor to patricia pogodzinska she is also a project team member but she's uh, above all a legal expert at the european union agency for fundamental rights so fra and her areas of expertise with respect to uh, the first work include uh, European human rights law, of course, non-discrimination, LG, LGBTI rights, business and human rights, of course, citizens' rights and freedom of movement. Before joining FRA in 2016, she had worked for several years as a lawyer at the European Court of Human Rights, the Council of Europe, and before in Poland as a solicitor and a university a lecturer and so of course being close to the courts on the one hand and then in the EU agency she has a, an incredible insight and also will be able to, to speak about um, uh, uh, Fra's report and the link we, with the report of the ELI. Patricia you, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction and for, for invitation to this very interesting event. Um, I will be very brief uh, and uh, hope not to uh, go over time. Uh, just to remind, already Diana said how uh, the whole cooperation began. It, it also started um, as from the FRA side, the work on business and human rights in 2016 when the Council adopted conclusions on business and human rights and it included a request uh, to FRA to formulate an expert opinion on possible avenues to lower barriers for access to remedy at EU level. That followed with a 2017 uh, opinion on improving access to remedy in this area and subsequently in 2017 the Commission requested FRA to collect evidence on access to remedy in, in member states. Um, Together, uh, especially at the very beginning, and because we conducted this in two phases, and in particular, in the first phase, uh, we had a very close cooperation with, with Ally, but also uh, subsequently, um, we wanted that the co co reports are complementary and that we find the problems, and then we ask Ally to find the solutions uh, to be very. Um, simplistic about it. So uh, first we published a focus paper in 2019 that was based on the desk research that basically uh, consisted of mapping of incidents uh, and kind of typology of industry sectors and characters of uh, and the types of uh, rights that were um, involved. And that was followed by a field work that was conducted in 2019 and 2020. And we pro had expert interviews in six EU member states. Uh, conducted by our uh, contractor Franet, namely in Finland, Germany, Italy, Poland, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. And we also 
uh, conducted additional interviews in France and the Netherlands. So what comes uh, from, uh, from, the, from the report? The main conclusions was that um, the experts found that existing relevant instruments do not take sufficient account of the reality and complexity of disputes involving big corporations. Uh, in most cases, there are multinational entities with complex structures and networks of subsidiaries and supply chains, and individuals are confronted with large entities, uh, uh, which in every stage of proceeding, proceedings, the imbalance of power looms large. And it is even for victims within the EU, not to mention, <clears throat> as was already mentioned here, um, when there is a case of third country uh, uh, victims in third country and a lot of additional cross-border complications. The EU and uh, United Nations and Council of Europe instruments point uh, to a need for judicial and a non-judicial mechanism to ensure effective access to remedy uh, for, for business and human rights related uh, abuse. However, our findings indicate that non-judicial remedies remain largely unknown uh, or they are considered to lack sufficient effect effectiveness or their potential is not fully used, also due to lack of uh, training, uh, often of uh, uh, legal professionals. Courts, uh, therefore, remain the main avenue for um, accessing justice in, in, in such cases. And most ancient reviewers pointed to specific procedures that uh, um, procedural obstacles that, that they faced when addressing such abuses. Uh, to be very brief, um, the obstacles they um, we can point to, to a couple of major uh, obstacles. First would be the shifting the burden of proof uh, or the lack of possibility to shift the burden of proof and uh, the necessity to oblige companies to disclose the information that victims need to even establish a claim uh, uh, to, 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 to make a, a proper case uh, that would be even admitted by the court. So proving wrongdoing or liability is, is often a major obstacle for victims. Um, depending on legal system, there, there's such a variety and, um, of, of different levels of liability that has to be and causality and the links to the damage um, that uh, has to be proved. And in majority of cases, uh, or one would say 100% of cases, documents to prove that are in the possession of companies. And even if there exists, and it's very limited uh, disclosure obligation in uh, the member states that we had uh, covered with the research, um, the expert, the lawyer said in practice, they were never ever granted a disclosure of a necessary document uh, because in order uh, to be disclosed, they would have to describe it as if they have already seen it and read it in detail. So the lack of evidence, uh, lack of access to evidence was a major reason of, uh, for the victims to lose the case in, in, in the cases that we had examined, that our experts were involved in. Another issue is the collective redress or representative action that has been also very, um, it's the point that is very largely also um, dealt with in LA report. Uh, the procedures should be accessible and efficient and cover all business related human rights abuse and uh, they should lower the fin financial risk that the individuals incur so they should allow for an examination of all aspects of the claim not just the underlying circumstances or legal grounds but also um, at also to be available uh, to provide um, to, to, to deal with damages at the same time uh, otherwise uh, separate um, damages proceedings increase the length and cost of the entire procedure. Um, with this is related also uh, the role of civil society and uh, ombuds institutions or consumer organizations or uh, different uh, national human rights institutions. Uh, financial and legal support of, uh, of civil society we found crucial. In all cases, individuals would not be able uh, even dream to provide, to, to proceed with the case. Uh, NGOs support victims on so many levels, starting from funding, from, uh, from providing financial support for lawyers, for experts' opinions, um, but also sometimes when possible, representing them in the court. Uh, and 
they have a very uh, unsafe situation in some member states regarding the illegal uh, uh, position, legal status, uh, whether they are called so-called qualified organizations to represent victims, whether they can have certain fiscal or procedural privileges. Um, it is unclear, it is not homogeneous, and that um, is very important to address. Um, also, uh, we have seen that ombuds institutions could be strengthened, like competence and the role. Uh, not all institutions, for example, has a, ha have a mandate to represent victims in court, and those who have, they face challenges due to lack of human and financial resources. Another uh, issue that was already mentioned is the cost of proceedings and the legal ad rules that could be reviewed so victims can afford to challenge businesses. Um, and that the cost of proceedings do not constitute a deterrent for victims and also for NGOs uh, who would be able to represent them. There are multiple costs of litigation that go beyond court fees. The court fees themselves may not be very high, but there are so many other costs like behind hiring a lawyer, the cost of gaining experts' opinions and the risk of having to cover the cost of the winning party, which is very often cases is, uh, is, the, is the corporation who can afford to hire, for example, 15 lawyers and, uh, and, and, and uh, dozens of opinions. Um, so the experts, they pointed that uh, the cost of proceedings are enormous even if the victim wins. So no matter whether the victim wins or not. And most of these cases cannot be recovered even if they win. And, and it's not always the case. Uh, I will not go into challenges uh, that, that has already been um, uh, quite deeply addressed, the challenges in cross-border cases and, and, the potential, and the potential solutions. And um, last uh, but not least, uh, the horizontal, the possible horizontal human rights due diligence that we will, uh, as I know here later. Uh, most of the experts, of course, uh, they mentioned that it might not be a solution to all uh, the problems that we are faced. But one of the aspects, the, the pro pro reporting aspects, for example, could be, um, could, of course, the due diligence, the all about due diligence is all about prevention, but um, we, we think that it might also in certain, depending on the final, um, final scope and, and, and the details of the, of the directive, uh, help maybe establish certain um, evidential uh, links between, for example, the different entities of um, uh, and, and, and links between the company and the, and the supply chain. And if some report, kind of reporting would be, would be uh, published that might also serve as evidence and could also serve, if possible, uh, NGOs uh, to monitor um, uh, compliance and maybe alert uh, if certain uh, abuses take place. Um, so, um, I think I will I will stop that maybe just with 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 one sentence that uh, one of our experts mentioned that it's uh, it's been so long that economic reality is not reflected in legal reality uh, that it is paradoxical that from a fiscal point of view holdings are considered as uniform subjects but then when it comes to judicial responsibility there are so many ways to uh, for it to be avoided and there of course uh, a very direct targeted instrument uh, would be ideal, but already with a very small um, changes in procedures and ad adapting, adjusting the legal procedure uh, could already enormously um, improve the situation of victims of, of abuses in human rights related issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patricia, for this overview of challenges and potential solutions. And as we can see, uh, these are very diverse and, and uh, also looking at different countries, maybe the aim uh, might be different. And, and I think you, you, we will come back, for instance, on the burden of proof in the questions, because I saw some questions were linked to that. So I, I look forward to that. But thank you very much for your uh, excellent uh, presentation. We have now uh, the pleasure to uh, 
to uh, give the floor to Heidi Hautala. She's vice president of the European uh, Parliament. Uh, she's a Finnish member of the European Parliament rep representing the Greens. Green, sorry, she was an MPA, <laughs> M MAP, sorry, from 1995 to 2003, and again from 2009 to 2011, and now has been an MEP without interruption since 2014. Uh, she's vice president since October 2017 and has been re-elected to this office in 2019. Member of the Committee on International Trade and of the Subcommittee on Human Rights, also a substitute member of the Committee on Legal Affairs. I think she has all what we would like to, in order to have an intuit, uh, astute uh, understanding of the report. <laughs> and so I, I really look forward uh, to uh, what she has to, to say about that uh, report. And, and so, uh, Vice President Heidi Hautala, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Chair, you promised you wouldn't read my whole CV. <laughs> so, but um, anyway, uh, I remember the day when I learned that the UN had decided that uh, not only did uh, uh, states have the um, overriding uh, responsibility to, to protect human rights, but companies would have uh, the duty to, to respect human rights and victims of uh, companies behavior would have a uh, right uh, to uh, access to justice and remedy. And I thought this is really something new and that's a little over mm, 10 years ago. But here we go. Uh, the first, uh, I would say, a really serious uh, uh, effort uh, to implement these UN guiding principles on business and human rights uh, is now going on in the EU. And I, I would believe that here the EU has a very good chance of, uh, of uh, showing that it can again be a norm maker and not a norm taker. So um, we have some expectations that when we manage to go through this legislative process uh, on the basis of the Commission's proposal of, of 23rd of February, that uh, the repercussions will be beyond the EU's borders because of the, the let's say, the market force of the EU. So, um, of course, the question of, um, of uh, access to justice and access to remedy is really key. And uh, me and my colleagues who work on this proposal um, in very uh, lively interaction with different stakeholders, progressive companies, uh, civil society and others, we believe that um, any EU legislation on, on uh, due diligence would not be meaningful if it didn't have a proper uh, means of access to justice and remedy. So, and that is, is one of the sort of key uh, core issues which we are debating and discussing uh, every day. So, indeed, um, this proposal that the Commission gave, what they now called Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, uh, please try to learn a new acronym, uh, CSDDD, -C this. Um, so it, uh, it has some really uh, good elements. It's based on the whole value chain, um, due diligence of obligations on the whole value chain, not just the, the, the first and second tier of a company. And it does have uh, clear liability provisions that definitely need to be improved. And we have heard from the ELI and, and um, FRA report many good proposals in that end. But um, a couple of weaknesses I need to mention. Um, the proposal is quite weak on, on the due diligence process. It's much too much relying on contract-based due diligence, which may risk um, in um, passing the responsibility uh, due to, uh, let's say, lower levels in, le um, levels in the supply chain. So, um, I think that is something that we have to address. Also, um, the question of, um, of the uh, scope of companies covered by the duty of due diligence is uh, somewhat disappointing. Uh, it remains to be seen if we can work on that. It's um, uh, very large companies beyond 500 employees and uh, we turn over, uh, over 150 million euro and um, uh, a limited uh, number of uh, uh, sectors uh, from um, large um, uh, enterprises, so not very large, but large beyond uh, 250 employees 
textile agriculture extraction of minerals. Uh, I think I can easily agree that these are what we could call risk sectors, but the list of course is not, uh, not at all, um, it's, it's not comprehensive. So we have to look at that because indeed, even smaller companies in risk sectors can, be, uh, can contain a lot of um, uh, risks for human rights and environment. Now to the enforcement. Um, I think uh, the proposal of the Commission is, uh, is a workable basis. Uh, it does uh, have two dimensions, uh, administrative sanctions and civil liability. Uh, member states uh, are supposed to designate national administrative authorities that can impose administrative sanctions, such as uh, fines or compliance orders uh, on, uh, on um, uh, failure to, to, to to fulfill the obligations on due diligence. Uh, also, the, the Commission is thinking about uh, setting up a European network of supervisory authorities that would ensure consistency. Here, I think we have to think about your proposal on, on this sort of ombuds uh, person or ombuds institution, because we have a bit of a discrepancy if um, you know we have all these uh, administrative um, uh, means available at member state level, and then to create a European um, level institution, ombuds institution. It's, I think it's an interesting idea that needs to be discussed. On the civil liability, uh, this clause ensures that companies can be held liable for harm and victims will get compensation for damages resulting from the failure to comply with the due diligence obligations, even if the harm has taken place in a non-EU country. So I think this is a good starting point, but um, indeed, uh, as we have heard, uh, we need to deal with the questions of, um, of the burden of proof. Uh, many of us would like to reverse the burden of proof. Uh, we have to deal with the, any, any problems relating to the statute of limitations uh, and, uh, and access to evidence is something that needs to be uh, dealt with. But um, the, the Commission uh, does not dream of, uh, of touching uh, private international law, which I think also could be discussed. Uh, I think uh, Diana Wallace is an expert of this. We have discussed this before. But uh, nevertheless, um, there has been no unanimity by the, among the member states to do that. So uh, what they say is something that also the European Parliament has proposed before in its own initiative report. Uh, in March uh, last year. Uh, so the EU law is overriding mandatory and it applies even if the harm occurred abroad. So to make available national level uh, civil, civil liability, civil liability means. Uh, I think it's an interesting idea and something that uh, has been thought about before that perhaps uh, the EU uh, directive on uh, consumer representative um, actions directive could indeed be, be amended to, to encompass uh, collective redress for business-related human rights abuses. This is also something that our um, uh, Commissioner for Justice, Divya Reinders, has, um, has aired many times, actually. So we'll have to see um, if, uh, if such a reform can be undertaken. Um, what can I say? I, I think um, we see very interesting court cases at the moment, which show that uh, the legislators now really have a momentum to, to sort of invite and even oblige the companies to, 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 to practice their responsibility for, for environment and human rights violations. And um, I think um, it's been quite sort of uh, really groundbreaking to see that in the Netherlands, uh, the, I think it was a class action by 17,000 citizens uh, to, uh, represented by, by Milieu Defensi Greenpeace Netherlands it is. And, and then um, against the Dutch Royal Shell, which actually uh, uh, gave uh, a ruling a year, about a year ago, uh, where it directly referred to the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And it, it ordered Shell to be much more ambitious in their uh, climate, um, to, in, in how they would uh, reach their, their climate targets and in, incorporating uh, to this uh, ruling also the, the subsidiaries uh, in Africa, in, in Nigeria. So I think companies start to understand that they are, there's already, I would say, and I'm not a lawyer, but I would say that there's a kind of an evolution of uh, customary international law. So we will see more and more of this kind of cases. So, uh, but access to justice is very random based. So we need to, to give, give a system which 
uh, is accessible and, and uh, as even as possible in this uh, mosaic-like framework. So um, I think um, I leave it to that because we still need to have um, more presentations and, and discussions. So, but anyway, I look very much forward to, to learning more from your report and working with all of you uh, when we are uh, putting this directive in, in order in the coming months. Uh, maybe a one remark is that um, um, up to 12 uh, committees in the European Parliament want, want to give an opinion <laughs> on this proposal. It's something totally unprecedented. Uh, we can be happy. Uh, it's a very hot topic. It really is. It's the talk of the town. But at the same time, there will be lots of people who have not uh, been much acquainted with this topic. So uh, there are some traps and dangers that we have to sort of try to solve. Thank you. Thank you very much. And of course, with so many committees, it will take a lot of time. Uh, <laughs> we have to so, control that somehow. So thank you very much for this uh, very interesting overview also of these uh, uh, um, commission proposal and then the parliament and then all the cases. But I think what you've said at the end, which is that the access to justice should not be random, uh, which is maybe also at, at the center in, in trying to have equality uh, in front of, of uh, this access to justice. Because of course, we always find cases and some good solutions, but it needs to be, uh, to be uh, on, on the broader basis. But before getting to Q &A, um, um, let's have our last speaker for, for tonight, John Morrison. He has been Chief Executive Officer of the Institute for Human Rights and Business since its formation in 2009 under the leadership of Mary Robinson, the former President of Ireland and former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. So John leads uh, IHRB's Global Strategy and Outreach, sorry for the acronym, and he sits uh, on the UK Foreign Secretary's Human Rights Advisory Group and uh, is, uh, of course, very influential in that. He is also currently co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Human Rights and therefore, I think, at the center of these uh, important issues. And uh, he has advised a number of governments, intergovernmental organization and business on human rights and wider issues of, of sustainability development and international affairs. So we are really looking forward to listen to you, John, you have the floor. Thank you, Pascal. Like, like Heidi, I was hoping you weren't gonna read that out. Um, a lot of things I do sound like oxymorons as well. So, uh, but but just I, I just wanted to make five reflecting points um, and trying to take a sort of wider policy view. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the authors, um, uh, all of you, for, for for a really good report. Um, and I say that as a non-lawyer. Um, um, just on George Orwell, um, Diana, you, you started with George Orwell's roses. George Orwell went to school about a, a half a mile from where I'm sitting in my home at the moment. Um, and I'm reminded also that the, the, the roses that come to Europe, many of them start their lives at Lake Naivasha in Kenya. And there's several 747s that fly overnight to the Netherlands from Kenya, where they're rebadged as Dutch flowers and then sold all over Europe. Um, so... Um, um, traceability in supply chains, I guess, is, 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 is something we should always think thinking about. Um, my, my first point then, I'll try and take them in the order the report does. So, so my first two points relate to mandatory human rights due diligence. And uh, like Heidi, I, I mean, I'd like to congratulate Heidi for her leadership in the European Parliament for many, many years on this issue. And it's, it's very, well, it's very gratifying to see it and also very sad as a, as a British citizen to know that we're not immediately going to benefit from it as well. Um, but there's long been this missing pillar, if I pillar 2.5, I would call it, between the due diligence pillar and the remedy pillar of the UNGPs. And if I just give an example of, say, the Unilever case in Kenya, we're sticking with Kenya for a while. The Kericho tea plantations, I think, are the biggest private sector employer in Kenya, 20,000 mainly women picking tea. And for years, for years, there were stories of sexual abuse, sexual favours, violence against women, which uh, were disbelieved um, by the lawyers and, and, and by the Unilever lawyers until eventually um, the, the thing became unstoppable. And Unilever has since talked about this publicly. 
Um, but what was clear is, is, is that the due diligence that Unilever was undertaking, you have to remember that Unilever was the first company in the world to issue a bespoke business and human rights report following the UNGPs about five years ago. But even Unilever uh, were miss was missing some of the endemic issues uh, in agriculture in East Africa and, and in agriculture in many places, such as violence against women. Um, and, then, and then when you get to pillar three, you get into this denial sense of, of throwing your lawyers uh, against the lawsuits that are coming your way. So there's long been this missing 2.5, this, you know, don't pretend as if these uh, human rights abuses are not there when they're endemic in your business sector or where you are. Uh, gear pillar three, your remedy system to one of belief and not disbelief, because you should know that the, the likelihood of, of these grievances being there is very high. And that's long been a problem. Um, I, 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 your report talks about the fact that due diligence shouldn't be a safe harbor. I agree with that. But obviously, there has to be some mitigative benefits to the company, as there is in health and safety law. Otherwise, why do the due diligence in the first place? Uh, and we must make sure it's not a tick box approach, which has been a bit of the danger of the French mandatory human rights due diligence. I think only 20% of the, the French human rights due diligence reports actually get to executive or board level. Um, hence, we've written a number of blogs about the fact that we really welcome the fact that the EU's proposal does talk about board oversight and director duties in relation to mandatory human rights due diligence. And I think that's really important. We mustn't lose that. We, we need to strengthen that, if anything. Um, my second point is on, again, on the mandatory due diligence side on evidentiary burden. I agree that, that the burden should be with the company and, and that in de facto, the offence should, should be not doing the due diligence in high risk areas, as opposed to waiting for there to be victims of that. Um, if you take the UK Modern Slavery Act as an example of, 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 of what happens at the moment is we're not in a know and show space, we're in a show but not know space where the uh, most of the modern slavery statements expunge any real knowledge of the real risks that sit, particularly migrant workers and recruitment agencies in the Gulf and other places. So that the approach that the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund took a couple of years ago in relation to private security companies in the Gulf was to penalize those companies for the absence of good due diligence, not waiting for there to be evidence of, of victims. Um, so I think that's well placed. My third point on collective redress, um, obviously I think that's a good thing. Um, and, and, and others have spoken about this already, um, the, the Shell case in the Netherlands. Um, there are, I mean, obviously, uh, we must hope there'll be more such successful class actions, but class actions do have problems associated with them. And I guess we should acknowledge those. Um, the, tra the Trafigura case in Cote d'Ivoire 15 years ago, there was some suggestion that, that the, 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 the victims weren't at, didn't actually, not all the victims actually benefited from the settlement. So you've got to make sure that there are mechanisms to redistribute the money or, or whatever the settlement is to, for all the victims and not just some of them. Um, I think contingency fees for law firms are a necessary evil. Um, so I accept that, that, that they, um, but you know, the confidentiality clauses, the lack of jurisprudence and other things that are associated with some of these cases obviously don't necessarily move us forward um, beyond, beyond recompense to the, the, the immediate victims. My fourth point around moving on to private international law um, and the focus on supply chain liability, um, absolutely key um, and, and of course it's got to move beyond first or second tier it has to take the UNGP logic around severity and the relationship between the brand and the suppliers and, and the victims. Um, the wider policy context in the EU for example I mean let's take GSP for example I believe GSP is still in place for Myanmar and I believe there are still 400,000 women working in the, in the export apparel sector in Myanmar. Um, the this kind of law of course would would probably have a chilling effect on uh western brands who are still there so I, I don't know how we balance off human rights impact from from human rights legal risk avoidance um similarly um the eu's green new deal 
um, cobalt and lithium come from places. Um, a lot of our aluminium and nickel, of course, come from Russia. And uh, over half of the world's copper is smelted in China. So what will be the implications for the commodities upon which the Green New Deal sits? And I think EU needs to line that up um, in its thinking. And then the other end of the value chain beyond supply chain is export. And the report doesn't touch on this. And I, you know, there, there are thousands of European companies exporting to the world, encouraged by export credit agencies to do so um, with, with minimal human rights due diligence. The state is also a powerful economic actor. The due diligence requirements around the export credit agencies governed by the OECD's common approaches is not aligned fully with the UNGPs. Um, and I would like to see more of an effort, I guess, within Europe and the European Union um, um, to try and get greater alignment between Europe's export credit agencies. Otherwise, we're getting very mixed messages to business from, 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 from member states. And the last point, the very last point here on non-judicial mechanisms, and I welcome uh, the ombuds mechanisms referred to in the uh, approach uh, report. Um, uh, national human rights institutions can sometimes play that role. And the South African Human Rights Commission has the right to seize assets, for example. Um, so there's a lot to be learned from other parts of the world, I think, in terms of those mechanisms. But what's missing, and I wondered why it's missing, it's probably deliberately missing, is, is no reference to binding arbitration mechanisms, which have crept into supply chain approaches in the Netherlands and Bangladesh. And of course, is a common approach around labor disputes. Um, having looked at the Court of Arbitration of Sport closely over recent years, it's a, it's a very strong mechanism with very weak human rights <laughs> uh, content at the moment. And I just wonder why we, we, we discount binding arbitration as a remedy when, when I think there are some evidence that uh, some of these mechanisms can hold powerful actors to account. But I'll stop there. Um, they're, they're, they're just, Pascal, some, some reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, for these uh, broad, really broad reflections on, on the various uh, stages, so to say, of the process. Uh, and, and since you were speaking about sports law, uh, I, I think we might begin with this first question that was posed uh, quite at the beginning. Uh, uh, and, and the question was really uh, whether uh, this uh, business and human rights aspect should also get into, more into, uh, into sports aspects. And I think, I don't know if I find the question again. Oh, well, I think I answered it. I ah, mean, that's it, why. It, ah, so okay. I, but, but I think we should discuss it as a panel. <laughs> yeah, because it I, I made a mistake of yeah. typing an answer and somehow it then disappeared. No, it's but, not uh, a mistake. It's, it's very apologize. useful that uh, <laughs> in, indeed uh, uh, someone wrote that they were actively campaigning on the issue of sports yes. washing in Europe. And yeah. how he, he says, how can we incorporate in your in your report and advocacy work due diligence, due diligence and, and liability of the sports governing bodies based in the EU, in addition to the EU's potential role in advocating for a Korean human rights based approach, because of course, many of these international sports federation have their seat either in Switzerland or in the EU. Uh, but of course, the impact is worldwide. So the question is also whether that could come into, into consideration. I see that you answered, but maybe I, I could uh, begin by giving the, the floor to Diana uh, as one of the core reporter. To what extent this whole, uh, let's say, industry or business related to sports, and of course, the difficulties with human rights might also play a role. And did you consider that in your report? The simple answer is no, I'm afraid. Um, and we had to draw lines around a lot of things because of, of time and space. Uh, but I think it's a very important issue that's raised. Um, but while you come to me, I, I would also like to take up John's point about binding arbitration. Um, and in a sense, it, it's, it's related, of course. Now, those who know me will know that I'm a huge fan and practitioner of both mediation and arbitration. Um, and I would love to have seen us do a little more in this report. But there were also voices around the table that felt very, very strongly that, you know, if we want a remedy, we want to get to a clear, um, enforceable remedy. And that takes some form 
of coercive power. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, even arbitration is a voluntary contractual process. Um, and okay, you've got the New York Convention to enforce an award, uh, but there are potentially difficulties there. I think it's something that needs to be um, examined a lot more closely because I think it can, can provide help. And I know there's an enormous amount of work um, being done um, by a group in The Hague and, and, and I'm in touch with them, but the report's now written and we are where we are, but don't think it wasn't thought about. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, by the way, I see a question asking where to find all these reports. And, and if you go to the answered question, you will find also the links for those who are looking for the reports and, of course, on the Internet as well. Uh, 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 John, you wanted to uh, to answer just, just today, on that question I, on yeah. sports. Yeah, because I'm probably not qualified to answer many of the others. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the court, I mean, the Court of Arbitration Sports is an interesting model because it does sit beneath the Swiss court system, so you can appeal to the Swiss federal courts. There is an element of jurisprudence as well, and some transparency, and it has, as we saw during the Beijing Olympics, you know, was able to hold some very powerful actors to, to account around the, the Russian uh, child athlete. So I... I, 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 I certainly don't think, having worked in the world of sport and human rights for a few years, that the, the, the binding arbitration mechanisms in sport are weak. Um, in fact, the, the issue in sport is you have this concept of the autonomy of sport, which is let, one of the reasons you have a lack of accountability in sport. And I think when we look at the internet and other areas where we wouldn't want to see a UN convention on the internet and human rights because of all the perverse consequences that would flow from that, I think we do have to when we think about accountability and remedy we have to think in a relatively creative way for some industries and i would say uh, the global internet uh, and internet service providers etc would be an example of that and to some extent sport as well because there are reasons why the autonomy of sport has existed as a concept it's been abused i agree but uh, but we must respect it as well thank you very much but of course also the uh uh, the uh, International Federation have accepted the uh, arbitration, uh, arbitration clause, which might be more difficult in other areas, of course, where you do not have an exportiva. Um, I, I'd like to come to another point that was raised through Heidi's uh, proposal and also, uh, I mean, and the EU proposal and Heidi's presentation, uh, uh, a question that is addressed to Ilaria, because someone said in, in, the, in the chat in the question, would it not be a, a, a good way to expand Article 7, Rome 2, uh, in order to encompass uh, human rights harm and therefore have a kind of applicable uh, choice of law, uh, which would uh, uh, help? And on the other hand, we have this uh, uh, proposed directive, uh, CSDDDD, uh, and, and, and what would be the uh, better approach, according to you, Ilaria, on that issue? Thank you, Pascal, and thank you to Professor Simeonidis for the, for the observation, uh, with which I totally agree. I think uh, it's, it's a one quick and easy choice of law solution for you to expand the scope of Article 7. Uh, and I also agree with Barbara Steininger, who said that the favor lays is certainly a better rule that as compared to overriding mandatory provisions, which do have this little touch of imperialism, I have to say. And Christopher Patz also seems, um, I, I do find it a more simple and elegant solution because uh, what I find worrying is the increased complexity and sophistication of uh, European private international law rules also as a result of the, of the good activism, but sometimes uh, of, the, of the EU. And as Gaulier observed also in the, in the, um, the I, do not, uh, I do not question the outcome of the judgment in Den Hague, um, but the judgment in the, in the merits arrived in 2022. So it took the same amount of time, two years, for deciding the case on the merits and before to decide the case on jurisdiction. So from 2017, we had to wait until 2019 only for a decision on the issue of jurisdiction. And the result 
the outcome was positive because they he heard the case, but it was the result of an articulation of rules and it, it led to a lot of discussion, legal disputes, which is at odds with uh, accessing a remedy and serves the interest of, of maybe of corporation that can rely sometimes on platoons of lawyers <laughs> uh, in a more, in a more efficient ways. So something I think it's wrong and maybe private international law needs to be looked at. I do favor these more simple solutions. Thank you very much for the questions. Thank you very much. And I understand from your answer that, of course, you believe in two private international law. I, I might come back to Robert Bray's uh, comment, and uh, he's also a co-reporter of the report, so I might come back to his comment. I wanted first to, to address the issue of uh, uh, um, uh, reversal of the burden of proof. And we, we have spoken about civil liability, about administrative measures, and Heidi Hautala mentioned these two aspects. And of course, we, we spoke also about criminal liability. And so I was wondering, maybe Patricia, you were the, the one who addressed also the, that reversal of the burden of proof, whether you think, because that was one of the question, uh, whether you think that this should also apply, apply in, in criminal cases, and therefore, if it applies in civil uh, uh, for civil liability, but not for criminal liability, for instance, which would seem normal, let's say, uh, do we not end up having a very strange system uh, where you, you might be liable really more easily because of this re reversal of proof in civil liability and, and, and then criminal liability might lies apart or whether would you advocate for a criminal liability having also this type of uh, uh, reversal of burden of proof? Um, it, I would say it all um, depends on the type of the abuse, because we have seen uh, very serious abuses regarding the right of health and even life, and also very small regarding consumer rights in, in the EU. And in, in principle, the all obstacles are, are basically the same. Uh, as regards the burden of proof, in, in, we have already, we have already in, in, in the EU system uh, in most, um, in all member states, um, the situation of a certain type of reverse of the burden of proof in discrimination cases or in labor cases. And the principle and the, the rationale for it is that it also, um, in such cases, the evidence is in the possession of the of the other party, not the claimant. And therefore, we see uh, uh, the resemblance here, uh, the analogy between this kind of cases, it it is it seems to be uh, reasonable to ask um, uh, the party who is in the possession of all the evidence to either rebut uh, the the accusation um, or or uh, or somehow justify it. Uh, as regards criminal cases, it, not, it, it would be probably difficult to have everything. We have seen in, in, in the cases that we have um, analyzed uh, all type, type of cases, civil, criminal, and administrative, it all dependent on the character of abuse and of the uh, instrument that the claimant choose to, um, to to take as a, as a legal basis for the claim. And it all depends on the jurisdiction of the legal culture of a given member state. And the lawyer would, uh, sometimes there is no choice. Sometimes the choice is uh, by the lawyer is made, made on, the, on the basis of, of their experience and, and the mm -hmm. type of, um, and what is easier or what has the better prospects in a given member state. In the criminal cases, uh, there are benefits. We have observed benefits and, and uh, advantages and disadvantages. Advantages would be that in that case, it's the prosecutor who is um, uh, uh, responsible for collecting evidence. And then as a, as a public functioner, they have a better access uh, and better possibility to to retrieve some kind, certain type of evidence from uh, from uh, from the other party. Disadvantages that were mentioned is that um, as a public prosecutor, as a public function uh, functioner, uh, prosecutors and courts, unfortunately as well, uh, can 
be subject of certain pressure, especially if the state is uh, uh, owner or um, stakeholder in, in the entity that is uh, accused. And um, some of our interviews raised this, uh, that it's a serious uh, issue, this, this, uh, this pressure from, um, from public authorities. Um, and the lack of political will or, or, or prosecutors actually not acting in the best interest of the victim. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Of course, we in some systems and in arbitration as well, we have these so-called negative inferences. And, and so if you cannot get the documentation, you may take negative inference, which goes at least to some extent into the reversal of the burden of proof. And that might be a kind of midway. I, I, I just mentioned before Robert Bray, who is one of the co-reporter of the project. And I think it might be interesting to, to put his remark to uh, Heidi Hautala linked to uh, the uh, CSDDD, because he says, it seems to me that we should be seeking simple solutions, which will allow victims to seek reparation in court in Europe against European companies whenever they are domiciled in the world. The simplest way of doing this through the recognition of a duty of care in the common sense of the word, such a duty can be extended to cover European companies' responsibility for entities in the supply chain uh, by contract. I can see no reasons, he writes, why limits to responsibility based on turnover and numbers employed should be imposed. It is disingenuous to take such an approach when we all know that companies engage in these activities in non-member countries because they are highly profitable, and they are highly profitable because corners are cut compared with European standards. Look at the price in Primark and so on. Private international law is not the solution, sorry, Ilaria. It is too expensive, lends itself to time wasting on procedure. And, and you were mentioning that, Ilaria, but I, I, I'd like to ask the question to Heidi Hautala first and then come to uh, Hilaria. Um, uh, do you think that it would be possible to say, you know, let's have due diligence and wherever it happens and for whatever company you will be liable, or is that maybe too uh, broad and, and not, uh, let's say, refined enough in order to, to achieve a political um, uh, 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 consensus? Because that's, at the end of the day, probably also one of your target. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, great to hear that you are one of the co-authors. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, of course, these, um, these limits uh, by numbers, uh, turnover, employees, these are arbitrary and uh, I think they are uh, fictitious. That uh, I think uh, what um, uh, UN guiding principles say is that uh, harm is not related to the size. But, but there are, you know, there is such an army of SME uh, interest organizations who are like uh, really up in arms against this proposal because they think it's a huge burden and it sort of uh, ruins their competitiveness. So these were the first to, to fall out. But uh, we hear more and more from uh, small uh, companies, for instance, in, in um, uh, garment industry in, in, in Europe, who say that, look, we need this legislation because we are a part of the supply chain of bigger companies. And if we do not have a proper duty of care, and, and if we can't prove that we, we practice it, we are out of competition. So. You know, we are in a kind of a transition, I think. Uh, by the way, can I give just a word to, to John on uh, this sort of this uh, Myanmar and Russia cases, because um, these are very topical, of course. And now, uh, now that all the companies uh, that consider themselves to be in, in sort of solidarity with Ukraine, they are, of course, very busy and for good reasons, because of the sanctions, they are withdrawn from, from Russia. But um, I was kind of... Uh, surprising myself to understand that even in those situations uh, human rights uh, due diligence must be practiced because these companies have also duties towards their employees for instance uh, in this horrendous uh, situation in Russia where freedom of expression is minus it's not it's not zero it's minus something so uh, there's a real danger for people being left on, on their own and and you also mentioned the Myanmar case I, I happen to know a lot about this because I'm the EP rapporteur on GSP regulation and we are sort of revising it so um, 
uh, yes, I think uh, this uh, due diligence legislation uh, will have a chilling effect on Western companies. But um, then the question is that um, what is the real impact? And uh, for instance, um, the GSP benefits to Myanmar uh, so far don't seem to 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 profit uh, the um, or benefit uh, the the army that has uh, conducted a coup. Uh, the moment when the EU realizes that, that they would, then of course these benefits would have to be withdrawn. But there's a whole lot of hypocrisy and uh, sort of I would say bad information around these these cases. Um, so it's it's not a simple thing to, to divest. It's not a simple thing to, to sort of uh, say that, okay, risks are too big, we go to another place. And then the nothing really happens on the ground. No improvement. And I think we are not just here to discuss our conscience, you know, how great we are as, as uh, ethical consumers. No, we want to have an, an impact on the ground in people's lives, in the poorest countries included. So... So John was nodded, but uh, nodding. But if he wants to add something, he's uh, really welcome. No, absolutely, Heidi. I was, uh, we, we have the you know, we've been running the Myanmar Center for Responsible Business now for uh, eight years with the Danish Institute for Human Rights, and it's funded by six European governments. Mm -hmm. But there's always the question: Should we continue? You know, given the divestment of Telenor and now the oil companies have left. But there are, you know, H and M is still there. Primark is still there. The 400,000 women working in the apparel sector bef before the investments of 10 years would have been migrating to Malaysia, many trafficked, some in forced labor. That's possibly what will happen if, if the international supply chain leaves. So I think it's a real, and I, the Russia point as well, you know, sanctions and boycotts are related but different things. And I totally agree, Heidi, and we've been saying this to investors and brands, if you're going to divest from Russia for, for, for solidarity reasons, you still have to undertake human rights due diligence. And I think um, it, it, it is important. And, and the other aspect to it as well, and we, you know, when we, we used to talk about Iran and Sudan, is some businesses are you know engaged in the provision of public goods right and state-like functions and the european convention on human rights recognizes that the ungps don't there's no un equivalency of that so again um i think it's imp i don't think the role of telenor in myanmar and coca-cola are the same <laughs> and yet the ungps tells us they're the same so i think we there's some tools missing miss, missing from our international box a little bit i think in when we think about the role of business in the provision of health, food, uh, basic infrastructure, et cetera, I think uh, the equation is slightly different than, than it would be for a consumer goods or a power company. But it's a long discussion, but uh, very much appreciate what you said, Heidi. Thanks. Thank you, John. Ilaria, uh, maybe, I don't know whether you want to react on private international law and choice of law, but maybe, or maybe you have the floor in any case. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I, I just would like to point out that uh, Robert Bray was co-reporter with me of the private international law chapter and that overriding mandatory rules are indeed rules of private international law. So private international law is really unavoidable here unless we want to draft a global law, which would be, of course, a super, but then it would be a law that applies uh, to the, I mean, borders would, would be erased forever. I, I wish to be so, but <laughs> until then, we need uh, to coordinate the, the, the divergence in, in domestic law with private international law methods. And uh, what I condemn, especially, is the, the sophistication that is leading now to litigation being concentrated on private international law issues instead of the merits. So we need to simplify private international law. <laughs> But thank you very much. Thank you very much. And that's probably also what uh, Robert means uh, e to some extent, at least. Uh, thank you. I, I see that we are coming to an end to the time allotted. And, and I might have uh, uh, some closing remarks. I, I think when, when listening to uh, the panelists and, and the questions also in the chat, I, I have the impression that uh, this report and the issue, of course, of business and, and human rights is such central and vital that it covers so many different topics. And all the issues that were mentioned, in fact, could trigger a whole discussion in itself. We didn't speak about costs. We didn't speak about uh, ombudsman 
uh, ombuds, uh, these super ombuds that might be very important. And, and, and so I, I'm sure that uh, the participant will take time to, to look through and, and read the, uh, the report because it has a lot of interesting uh, ideas. But just as a matter of understanding, it seems to me that what is really interesting is how these different elements get into uh, one another. Uh, as was mentioned, we have this due diligence, uh, important uh, due diligence on human rights as a central piece, but taken alone, it would not be sufficient. You need some teeth then to, to, to be sure that this brings a gain for the company on the one hand and also triggers some consequences if this has not been done or if it pre, uh, doesn't prevent from, uh, from a, a violation of human rights, which means that we need this access to remedies and, and an effective access to remedy, which means, uh, first of all, getting liability on civil and administrative level, but also effectiveness in terms of procedural aspects as we have seen, be it private in international law, so choice of forum, choice of law, but also the issue of uh, uh, reversal of burden of proof or other procedural aspects like money and how do we deal with the cost issue. And, 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 and then, of course, this is not sufficient. You need recognition. And so uh, the New York Convention was mentioned 1958, which enables in more than I think 140 countries in the world to have direct implementation. That might be an idea, but of course uh, that needs to have uh, upfront uh, an arbitration clause, which might not be possible. That's why usually uh, it's better to have on the one hand courts, on the other, maybe ombuds or, or, or non-judicial uh, remedies. And I think that is the key factor. If you have some teeth at the end of the supply chain, so to say, uh, you might also have good due diligence uh, at the beginning and, and, and to have a, a right balance between all these aspects is probably the main aim. And at least when I listened to you, I, I had the impression, well, there's already a lot that has been done by the various reports. And, and I really truly look forward to, to the work of the EU Parliament in that respect, because even if it's a new acronym, CSDD, or, or whether the Parliament comes with new ideas, it will certainly help to have effective remedies. And, and in that sense, I would like to thank all the reporters of the, uh, of the ELI report, first of all, but also the other aspects that we mentioned today, and, and especially the panelists for their very uh, uh, thoughtful uh, remarks, questions, uh, answers, and also uh, everyone who participated to this, uh, to this uh, panel and webinar, because I think it was very interesting. I learned a lot and I hope you did too. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for taking the time and giving us time uh, as panelists also to be here tonight. And I look forward, of course, to further discussions on these various aspects. So thank you. And I think that uh, brings our webinar to an end. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.